morning, everybody. I think this is the fullest I've seen RightsCon this early in the morning. Thank you all for coming out. We really appreciate you being here on the last day of the conference. I hope it's been really rewarding so far and that you've had a lot of good experiences. Um, I want to take a second and introduce this wonderful gentleman to my left. Um, this is Ron Debert, who is the director of the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs. Um, Ron, can you just start by talking a little bit about Citizen Lab and about the work that you're doing there? There we go. Uh, well, first of all, let me say thanks for inviting me here and, and congratulations to Brett and the whole Access team for putting on this amazing event. Um, everyone here I know is enjoying it. So. Uh, so in terms of the Citizen Lab is a uh, research group at the University of Toronto that does research from a mixed methods perspective on information controls. By mixed methods, I mean we combine uh, disciplines of computer science, engineering, law, uh, area studies, field research, uh, to do um, a variety of research projects, basically from a civil society perspective. We're not an advocacy group. Uh, we're interested in approaching questions uh, from a human rights perspective and uh, trying to uh, produce reports that are uh, very rigorous and evidence-based that help inform some of the debates that we're all interested in here. Thank you so much. So just, um, we're going to bring up our other guest in just a second, but as a preliminary matter, if you have questions at any time that you'd like to ask either of the people um, that we're going to be talking with this morning, please go to slido.com um, and enter keyword rightscon. And if you tap over to the hub, you can enter questions and they'll pop up on this screen that I have in front of me right here, so long as it stays on. And I'll be able to ask the guests um, what your questions are. And you can also upvote other people's questions if you think somebody has something specifically good to say. Um, so we have, I think, we have somebody else who's joining us. Um, maybe. Hi, Edward. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Do you want to say hi to the rights, con rights con crowd real quick? It's wonderful to see you. Everybody who's here, I got to say, this is the kind of crowd who already understands a lot of what the problems are and what we need to do to fix them. The challenge is, how do we expand our reach, right? A lot of these issues are not uh, visible to you know, the, the mass of uh, the audience, the larger portion of it. And increasingly, we see governments that are trying to prevent them uh, from being able to do so. Uh, we see a lot of uh, efforts, uh, including in countries like Russia, where they're actually using the pretext of copyright protection and things like that to pass new laws, to pass new regulations, to create new fines for discussing what they call the propaganda of circumvention tools, things like VPNs and Tor and so on and so forth. But what we're really talking about there is the right of access, the right to be able to connect, the right to be able to associate, the right to be able to discuss. Uh, and while this is a really challenging time to be living in, uh, in the context of these issues, because so many governments, so many institutions, so many corporations uh, feel increasingly threatened by our ability to understand, contextualize, and communicate uh, what these new threats are, the thing that really gives me hope, that keeps me going, the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning is the fact that we have rooms around the world filled with people like you. And I think because of that, maybe, maybe we can carve out a victory here and there and ultimately leave behind more rights than we ourselves inherited. Thank you so much for joining us. Both of you, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. It's great to be here. Um, so to just get started, we like to think that RightsCon is the leading event at the intersection of technology and human rights. So as Edward pointed out, we have an audience of activists, journalists, lawmakers, policymakers, kind of the entire walk of life um, sitting here in front of you. Um, so to start, I'd actually like to ask you to tell people a little bit about your own theories of change and what you're working on right now, what you're excited about, and what you're trying to accomplish. 
Ed, do you want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. Um, in the context of this, you know, there's there are a number of different levels that we can have impact uh, as people working on efforts to change the status quo, where we have uh, increasing levels of intervention, of interference, uh, of lawful or unlawful activities and operations that begin to sort of impinge uh, or limit the boundaries of our rights. Uh, and we see this around the world with sort of hacking operations that are targeted against journalists, against uh, NGOs, human rights organizations, um, and even people who some governments, they uh, could reasonably argue, are radicals uh, or radicalizers, as they prefer. Uh, but at the same time, these aren't individuals who are known uh, or even suspected to be associated with violence or terrorism. And once we start going down that path, there's really a question of how do we fix it? How do we stop it? How do we make sure that people can organize, they can communicate, they can reach? Uh, and in my work at sort of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, is increasingly becoming technical uh, because there are people who are, are better positioned in policy circles, in political circles, uh, to make arguments, to change minds, uh, because I don't have a background uh, you know, in politics. I'm an engineer. But increasingly, we're seeing that technology, even though it's being used as a sword against the public in many different spheres, it can also be a shield. Uh, Technology and our science more generally is increasingly becoming means where we can enforce human rights through new means beyond borders, across jurisdictions. Because we have to remember at the end of the day, even if we get sort of a renaissance of reform in the United States or Germany or France or some other country, uh, that's not going to help everybody else. That's not going to help people in China. That's not going to help people in Iran. That's not going to help people uh, in, in Yemen or Dubai or any other place. Uh, and I think increasingly we have to work very hard uh, to expand and create uh, a, a nexus of, of fusion, a sort of sense of critical mass uh, of values, of community, where we're reaching in and pulling people in a cross-disciplinary sense, exactly the kind of work the uh, Citizen Lab is doing um, and Freedom Press Foundation is now increasingly doing as well where we work in the same sort of multidisciplinary uh, approaches sort of across domains, across boundaries that our adversaries are. Uh, well, actually, just picking up on that, you asked, you know, what you're, we're working on now, what we're passionate about, and <clears throat> I feel very strongly about the role of uh, university-based, evidence-based research of the type that Citizen Lab is doing. and. Uh, right now, I feel uh, so fortunate to be surrounded by such an extraordinary team of, of people at the Citizen Lab that I work with every day. Some of them are back there. Um, and, and we're at a really good space right now. We know what we're doing and how uh, we have a vision that we, and what we want to accomplish. Uh, we see ourselves uh, as part of a growing community of university-based and uh, researchers that are working on bringing evidence to questions of information controls. Essentially, as I often say, lifting the lid on the internet, whether that's through reverse engineering, uh, mobile applications to find hidden security vulnerabilities, maybe that have been baked in at the request of governments, or doing network measurement techniques to identify the vendors of filtering or surveillance equipment. Um, in the early days of the Citizen Lab, the, the inspiration for this, I've said this maybe once or twice, was. Uh, you know, I was actually thinking about uh, the methods that state intelligence agencies use, especially the combination of technical intelligence and human intelligence. And as a, as a student of this, I, I thought, you know, why isn't it that you can't plagiarize those methods, turn them on their head to watch the watchers, and uh, set up essentially a civil society counterintelligence capacity. Um, and that was really the inspiration for the Citizen Lab. In the early days, I had no basis to make that claim. It was really unfounded hubris. And I think actually some people maybe in my government took it too literally and they said, who's the crazy professor in Toronto who's talking about setting up a counterintelligence capacity for civil society? Um, so I dropped that language. But effectively now, what, what we have created and what we are a part of with our partners, many of whom are here in this room, our Cyber Stewards Network, uh, working with groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and others, is part of a growing movement um, that applies rigorous methods 
to bring forward evidence to, to shed light on what's going on in areas that governments and corporations don't want you poking into. And I think that research is essential to everything else that we're doing um, because you need the data, you need the facts to be able to support uh, the policy claims, the advocacy, the litigation that anyone is doing uh, beyond that to promote and protect human rights online. So you both talked a little bit about messaging and about how to take what you're doing and communicate it out. And I'm just interested in what your strategies are, because they're very different, um, the way you both approach things. The strategies for packaging the, the materials that you think are really important and relevant um, and sending them out into the audience. I think one of the things that we've seen is that there is an increasing divide between people who really understand technology and who can actually um, implement the tools and the techniques um, needed to protect themselves and people who maybe don't understand technology and rely a lot on defaults and products as they come out of the package. Um, and it becomes really important to educate those people, especially as we're talking about things like encryption mandates that are popping up all over the world um, that could actually make the defaults really insecure. And so what do you think about as you're, as you're messaging things, as you're trying to talk to people? Is there any rules of the road that you go by? I know, I know Edward has, has just a couple Twitter followers that, that pay attention to him um, and, and look and try to see what he has to say. Yeah, Ron, why don't we let you uh, sort of start the conversation on this one since I took the last one. Uh, sure, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we take the, the communication of our, our research uh, very seriously at, at Citizen Lab. And uh, for every research project that we're engaged in, we have a, a multiple track effort. So part of it is to make sure whatever we're doing is uh, peer reviewed and taken seriously in the academic peer community of which we're a part. So we make sure that we place uh, referee journal articles in conferences and so on. The reason we do that is if you, if you don't have legitimacy in that community, uh, then um, you know, you're, you're, the basis of your research uh, may be questioned. And so it's very important to target and communicate to that particular audience. Um, but then you also have to communicate to the public, to your partners in, in the world of advocacy and, and, and human rights and communities, and the general public. And for that, it requires being able to take sometimes complicated terms and translate them into um, basic messages. And we work a lot with journalists. Uh, journalists, in fact, have become study subjects of ours now because, as Ed said, so many journalists are now targeted uh, by digital attacks. And journalists are often the uh, entry point for us to some of the most interesting cases. But they are also very helpful when it comes to helping to communicate uh, what it is that we want to communicate. It forces you to, um, uh, to clarify your message and to get it out there. I, I will say something uh, about Ed, if, if you don't mind, Ed. Um, you know, when, when what happened in, in 2013 uh, did and, and the documents came out, the disclosures came out, uh, I think I, I probably am speaking for a lot of people in this room where we didn't fully anticipate how articulate you are. Um, and it, it's you know remarkable to, to have someone in your position who also is such a, a great interlocutor for a lot of these debates. And I just want to thank you for that, uh, for doing what you're doing at events like this. <laughs> you can embarrass me. Um, it, it's. It is weird being kind of thrust into a position uh, like this where, you know, I had never talked to a journalist before uh, prior to Glenn Greenwald, uh, Laura Poitras, uh, Barton Gellman in, in 2013. Um, I had made a career as an intelligence officer, which made me really shy away from that kind of communication. Um, and it's not a secret that most technical people uh, sometimes have challenges in the social communication department. Um, <laughs> I'm a little bit fortunate here because I, I think before I, I focused on uh, computer science, I actually wanted to be an English major, uh, but that didn't work out. Um, but there's, there's really a key lesson here. And this is the fact that we have an unequal burden uh, relative to sort of the, the forces that we're in friction with, that we're in tension with. Um, corporations can hire specialists for every single niche role. 
they'll have the most polished PR man. You know, they'll have the best lawyer out there. They'll have the uh, best lobbyists. They'll have the best engineers. They'll have the best everything because they can pay for it. Government, uh, on the other hand, has an extraordinary privilege in terms of the deference that journalists are willing to show them. If we rewind back to 2013, it becomes very clear what a total absence of skepticism uh, that there was. And this continues today uh, in relation to sort of that, that connection, uh, that dynamic between journalism uh, an institution, uh, because it looked a lot like this in 2013. Does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect, but not not wittingly. And everyone believed it, right? Uh, now, 10 days after that happened, uh, Laura Poitras, uh, the, the first journalist that I was able to get in contact with uh, regarding the archive, said in her diary that was recently published uh, at, a, at a museum in New York that she got a letter from her anonymous stranger she was in contact with promising that she would get documents almost immediately after that happened. Uh, almost as if that was an impetus, almost as if that was what uh, sort of made this individual that she was in communication with, of course, was me, um, cross the Rubicon. And this is critical because we go, how do we transition beyond that, right? How do we move to action? We move from belief to action. And I think ultimately it comes down to understanding what your values are writing them for yourself, thinking them for yourself. And this has increasingly become dangerous, particularly in many countries where we don't enjoy the same protections that we do in the United States. Because how do you develop your thoughts, right? How do you determine what it is that you truly believe? How do you determine what it is that you really want to say if you can't even keep notes safely, right? If you can't have some private space, some space for thought, some space to enjoy the product of your own intellect, to share that with people close to you who you trust, whether they're family, whether they're colleagues, whether they're uh, sort of compatriots in, in your uh, social movements. And ultimately, I think we reach a point where we have to become comfortable. We have to create a culture where people are comfortable making decisions in a vacuum, uh, in sort of the sanctity of their own private space. And it's not that I would say I'm particularly eloquent. It's not that I would say uh, I have special talents or training here because I don't. I didn't graduate from high school. Um, but because I really took the time in a situation, and I took a lot of risks. This was actually a mistake uh, from the counterintelligence perspective. But I talked to my colleagues. I said, what do you think about this? You know, look at this. This shows we're collecting more intelligence on Americans, more uh, communications on Americans in America than we are on Russians in Russia. Is this really supposed to be our division of labor? Uh, and of course they would say, yeah, you know, that's kind of crazy, but uh, you know, maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's not right. Maybe the tool's got a glitch in it, you know, but whether it is or isn't, you know what happens to people who say something about that. Uh, and it's true, obviously there are, uh, there are costs. Uh, power admits nothing without a demand. Uh, and if we don't challenge them, even at cost, nothing will change. Now, that's not to say that we need to wait for sort of individuals in these perfect dynamics of circumstance. Uh, we need to constantly be pressuring power, whether it's corporate power, whether it's government power, whether it's a criminal organization, whether it's typical corruption, whatever it is, uh, to allow us, to permit us, or, or more directly, to not be able to stop us from finding out what the truth of our world is and being able to apply our political beliefs, to apply our vote of action to the direction of the future of our society. So to switch back to substance a little bit, I think there are so many negative things happening right now, so many threats that we're responding to. In fact, um, right now there's an emergency session that popped up on um, laws being proposed to um, bent down freedom of expression in other parts of the world. And so we had to pop up a whole new session just to deal with that issue. Um, 
one of the threats that we're facing is this threat to encryption um, that I alluded to earlier. Um, there are encryption mandates popping up all over the world. Um, one of the, those threats is in the, the United Kingdom where the, the investigatory powers bill um, and the associated documents actually would allow the government to force companies to insert malware through updates. Um, and that's a real big problem for trust on the internet and trust of communications. So the question is, should that be something that governments consider placing in the law? Is that a, an action that we, we should look at um, what safeguards need to be in place if, if government hacking is occurring? Um, and Ron, I know you do a lot of work on government use of off-the-shelf products um, and how they use those in order to perpetuate some of these activities. Um, are there controls that should be in place? You know, we've kind of walked a little bit back from the Vassanar Agreement. Should we be putting more controls or regulations in place to control these industries? Um, and Edward, do, does, this, does your calculus on this question change a little bit with the fact that once something is used for a national security purpose, it actually often becomes used by law enforcement or by the FBI in the United, United States at least in different ways that are not expected. So you have the national security apparatus at the top and then it kind of filters down to the everyday police um, as time goes on. Yeah, so that's a, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. Ed. No, no, please, Ron, go ahead. Uh, so, you know, this is a big topic, and obviously it's probably the topic that's been talked about most at, at, at this conference and leading up to it with the FBI Apple issue. It's been in the news, and I, I, I think what we're dealing with here is um, a, a fundamental problem of public policy, national security and civil liberties, and computer security, information security, and different perspectives of security, and the clash between the national security paradigm and a different paradigm that is hopefully emerging where people think of the security of users first and foremost and this undifferentiated network that we call the internet uh, that we all love and hope to keep secure and open at the same uh, time. Uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, you have many agencies now and governments that are very well equipped, uh, many of whom wear uh, these dual hats. Uh, on the one hand, they're supposed to be helping secure ourselves and our networks, but then they're developing uh, capacities to undermine them, to exploit them, to destroy them and degrade them. Um, what worries me most actually is what's coming down the horizon. Uh, and this is why we are particularly interested in looking at consumer applications, things like mobile browsers in a market like China, uh, when you begin to peel back the layers of these technologies and you see, uh, oh my God, you know, uh, you have uh, dozens of vulnerabilities that are throughout uh, these applications that hundreds of millions of people are depending on, um, you know, who needs a Trojan horse when you can get a mobile application installed that's insecure and you can push a malicious software update like we demonstrated. You can essentially take over the device, track people through their device IDs. Um, we, we live in this environment where we're emitting now uh, a digital exhaust constantly around us that uh, governments and other threat actors are able to exploit. Um, so th this is a, a major public policy issue that involves very complicated uh, uh, debates and, and uh, questions that cross uh, domestic, international jurisdictions. Obviously, my preference uh, is, like probably just about everyone in this room, is that we need strong encryption uh, from uh, ev throughout every aspect of, of the uh, infrastructure uh, to protect communications to protect our security, but that's not the way uh, the trend line is actually going, and it worries me greatly. This is a really complicated space, and it's not made easier by sort of the claims of government. I don't want to get too deep into the uh, Apple versus FBI thing, because I'm sure it's been talked to death, uh, but the bottom line is, you know, technical experts knew from day one that there were alternative means of getting into this phone that were uh, not reliant upon Apple. Uh, these were laboratory techniques that existed since you know, the, the 1990s. Um, they're well established. Every university in the country has the equipment to do these kind of things. Uh, you could even perform these sort of attacks. Uh, they're done for beneficial purposes at Chinese markets in less than you know, uh, 30 minutes. 
where they'll swap out sort of memory chips on your phone to give you more capacity. And the same kind of attacks would apply to enable the capabilities the FBI was looking for. Uh, they just have to go to a Chinese market and pay $7 instead of uh, sort of commandeering one of the most important companies in America by market uh, sort of value. And when we back out from that, right, when we put, set the corporate interests aside, uh, when we set sort of uh, the basic argument in context, we realize that this really isn't about one particular phone. This isn't about this, that, or the other. This is ultimately an argument about authority. It's about power. And it's about who holds it within the context of society. And when we travel further down that path, it becomes clear this is actually an issue of basic liberty. Um, does the public enjoy the same right to privacy that we have in the past? Uh, are we still private citizens and then public officials where the government knows very little about us, but we know everything about them? Or are the dynamics of the modern day where we see greater and greater levels of classification, we see prominent politicians who are creating sort of secret email servers to exempt themselves from public records laws, and their defense for doing this kind of activity is saying, well, other politicians did the same thing. That, for me, isn't a defense, because it's not really about that politician. I don't care about that politician. I care about the trend. I care about the culture, and that's what we should be focusing on. Why are we, the public, becoming disempowered at the same time that governments around the world, corporations around the world, institutions around the world, are gaining greater and greater leverage over the range of our activities, uh, their knowledge of what we do? Uh, and I would just uh, sort of bookend this with one caveat simply on the language that we use to describe this. Uh, Ron made a nod to sort of the metadata problem um, by calling it digital exhaust. I don't like the term digital exhaust because even though we know it's sort of harmful, it's in a low level context, and it's not really clear what that means. Uh, the digital exhaust, the metadata, what metadata actually means are activity records, right? Everything that you do today that where you're interacting with a device on the network produces a transaction record either of a communication made, uh, a, a fact that you passed a cell phone tower that you're a subscriber to and it checked you in in what's called a visitor location record, invisibly, just because this is how phones work, right? When you dial a number, how out of all of the phones in the world does the cell phone company know which phone to ring to give you the person that you're trying to talk to? Well, it's because every phone is constantly checking in, saying, here I am. But this also happens in the context of your purchases. This also happens in the context of your searches. Uh, you know, this isn't news to people in the audience, but we need to think of a way to describe that. We really need to think about the language problem here uh, that works in a way that makes it clear that we're not talking about some sort of uh, abstract or ephemeral uh, thing that's out there. We're not talking about science fiction. We're not talking about potentials. We're talking about things that are actually happening. Uh, comprehensive records of all of your private activities at all times are being produced uh, simply by nature of the way that our devices were designed and built and standards that were created in the 1970s and 1980s that we've simply inherited without updating. We get to a point where protocols and standards have to change. The actual sort of laws of the land for our technical systems need to be updated in a comprehensive way because this is the only way to make sure that these things actually change in a meaningful, fundamental way that applies to everyone everywhere. Otherwise, we're trying onesies, twosies in this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction uh, where we're able to carve out something. For example, privacy laws in the United States, we're one of the only Western democracies that doesn't have a basic consumer privacy law. We have a few sort of niches, uh, like a HIPAA law in, in health. Uh, we've got credit. Uh, privacy laws, but we don't have a general rules of the road that go, look, you can't collect this, you can't share this, you can't do anything with this unless you're abiding by these basic rules. And so there's no commercial pressure, there's no commercial impetus that makes sure when we think about these things, we're developing safe systems from day one rather than designing unsafe structures that aren't putting individuals at risk, they're putting society at risk. And we're simply hoping that no one will take advantage of the sort of tragedy of the commons problem that we're building for ourselves. So I'm looking at the audience questions, and the audience is really interested in what both of you are doing next. And I'm going to take a cue, and I'm going to start with 
Edward, um, because the audience wants to know what you think Citizen Lab should be doing next. And so then I'm going to ask Ron what you think the next role is that Edward should take on in his you know, post-whistleblower, he is now fairly established uh, that, capacity. That's easy, I got a, I got a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll start with the Citizen Lab. Some of the things that Citizen Lab has done in the past that have had incredibly high impact, at least in the circles that I sort of travel in, were investigations of- Kind of scares me when you said that. <laughs> the corporate involvement uh, in surveillance, right? They're making a business of surveillance that preys on the vulnerabilities of our systems. Uh, and this is where they develop or they hire really talented, really capable people, people who could be fixing fundamental problems, people who could be saving lives, people who could be protecting journalists. And instead of allocating these people in sort of the defense of free societies, uh, they're being paid significant amounts of money uh, to develop attacks, to develop exploits uh, that are then not patched, they're not fixed, they're sold uh, to governments and countries like Sudan, uh, where they're being used against uh, activists and, and human rights organizations. And it's creating kind of a moral hazard where when you start to set a standard, when you start to create a culture paradigm where it's more rewarding to work against a liberal open society than it is to work in defense of it, uh, what does this mean? And when it happens in secret, without the knowledge of, let's be honest, 99% of the public, um, what does that really say for how effective our journalism is, for how effective uh, the free press rights uh, and, and sort of paradigms that we've, uh, we have the privilege of using, how much positive impact they're actually having in sort of curtailing and preventing the moral abuses that traditionally in the past, once exposed, would begin to sort of shrink away uh, and wither when exposed to light. Uh, so these, these investigations are powerful, but at the same time, once you've shown it's there, you have to move on to the next thing. And Citizen Lab's done a really good job of that. I would say one of the big challenges here is finding out how do we normalize the idea that academics can work on problems, uh, that governments are actively opposed to them investigating and create a counterculture here that is much like journalists, uh, at least at some point in our history, uh, self-identified that the idea that their role in society was to be a watchdog, to be an adversary to government, to hold the government to account. Can we get academics to embrace those same ideas? Well, that's, that's a powerful uh, uh, statement to make, and I, I believe very passionately in um, maybe in a, a bit of a naive sense in the, in the fundamental principles of academic freedom and the role of the university. Um, it was, after all, uh, out of the university that the internet was born, and a lot of the principles of the university system are around openness and peer review and so on uh, that we associate with, with some of the best of the internet principles uh, came from the best of the university's uh, system. Um, I, I, it's difficult because right now uh, the countervailing tendencies are in the opposite direction. You have so many resources going into universities coming from the military industrial complex to, uh, to, to approach cybersecurity from a jobs first perspective, but also from a national security perspective. Um, it's also very difficult for us to do what we do and compete with the private sector. To, to bring in talent to work with us at the Citizen Lab um, is very difficult because we just can't uh, offer the same wages that people can, can get in the big uh, uh, private uh, uh, companies. Um, so that's a challenge for us. However, what we've worked on over the last uh, few years is really trying to build out the community. So, you know, there's, we're a small group. We're a very small organization. Um, but if there are more organizations with whom we can collaborate who approach the topic in the same way, I, think, I really truly believe uh, we can have an extraordinary impact as a kind of uh, verification mechanism or check on what both uh, private sector actors are doing and what governments are doing. And so one of the things recently that's happened, and I feel it's just terrific, are these fellowship programs we, that we're participating in where people rotate through university partners, spend a bit of time at Citizen Lab, 
Uh, there's the OTF, Information Controls Fellowship Program, uh, Google Policy Fellowship Program, Mozilla has a fellowship program. Um, by the way, Ed, if you want to apply to become a Citizen Lab Fellow, you can work remotely, just saying. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a very flexible director. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> um, but I do have a question for Ed, actually, in the, in the status of the disclosures. Um, so one of the things that I really respect uh, is the way that Ed uh, very carefully and thoughtfully uh, deliberated on the choice that he made under extraordinarily, what must have been extraordinarily uh, tense atmosphere in terms of how to dispose of these documents. Uh, the decision was made uh, by Ed to put them in other people's hands and, and have them act as custodians to make sure that they're properly tended to. And uh, I think uh, the public has really benefited by that. I know, uh, speaking for myself and my team, uh, we were able to work with the CBC uh, who collaborated with The Intercept on the Canadian-related uh, Snowden disclosures. And uh, that was really uh, eye-opening for us. We were able to go through this very carefully, uh, including uh, advising as best we could the journalists as to what not to publish, which I think is um, quite a, an important responsibility, and we took that very seriously. Uh, now, uh, we're three years later, uh, what is the status of the documents? I, I think there are many people in this room uh, who, like me, would want to be able to explore more of that material, but there is a bit of uncertainty now as to where they are and uh, not, I don't mean physically, I mean in terms of ownership and custodianship and so on. Personally speaking, I, I don't think the model that's in place now is the best model. Um, I think uh, having uh, the documents of such important value for public policy entrusted to essentially uh, a media organization is not the way that, that, that I would like to see it evolve over time. I think, especially as time passes, we should be thinking about something like maybe an independent advisory board uh, that is set up uh, that would adjudicate applications from journalists and researchers who want to responsibly investigate the material um, and, and bring to light some other stories uh, that simply one organization from a capacity perspective isn't able to deal with effectively. So I'm, I'm wondering if Ed uh, thinks about the status of the materials uh, going into the future. And if I could just piggyback a question onto that, and what advice would you give to the next person who is going to follow your footsteps? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a really important space for discussion. I, I don't think it gets enough. There's one big challenge, which is that I don't really call the shots anymore because I no longer have access to any of the material. Uh, it is uniquely held by the media organizations. So I can say, hey, you know, here are my thoughts, but ultimately it's no longer my decision. Uh, and that's actually proper, I think, because you don't want a single individual uh, making decisions that have gigantic uh, public policy uh, ramifications. And the press is uniquely situated in society to make sort of those public interest determinations. Now, there is this countervailing argument that I actually am quite convinced by, which is particularly when the period of greatest danger has passed, um, you know, when the National Security Agency or CIA or FBI or DIA or whoever theoretically, uh, you know, some future leaks uh, documents would be uh, the ones in controversy, uh, have had time to adjust, have had time to change, you know, where their people are located, if they think somebody's at personal risk. Uh, the calculus does begin to change. It should be revisited. Now, there are uh, defenses against this that are actually quite compelling. Uh, one of the least, or one of the, the most uh, persuasive is the fact that I know for a fact uh, at least one of these media organizations has approached a public university, uh, one that's particularly well regarded, and said, why don't you uh, use sort of your center who's dedicated to this kind of journalism, this kind of work, to take custody of these? Uh, and you can sort of, in perpetuity, play the role of national, international, global library uh, and handle access requests and everything like that, uh, crediting journalists. And they said, whoa, that is too hot for us. And that's because many universities are reliant upon government funding, government grants, and even outside the United States. Uh, because of the 
international nature of the collaboration that happened against the public here, where many of these documents don't just implicate the United States government, they implicate what's called sort of the Five Eyes Network, uh, the US, the UK, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, uh, in addition to wider uh, groups of uh, what they call uh, third party partners you start to see that it's quite difficult to find an institution that's both got the credibility publicly to handle this in an appropriate way uh, and the capability uh, that they can protect this from the charges that national security officials will level, which is, look, these are academics. They don't know what they're doing. They can't fight against Chinese spies. They can't fight against Russian spies and so on and so forth. So how do we resolve this tension? And this was actually something that, you know, I'd be happy to hear other people's uh, arguments on because it, it's very much a point of public discussion. This is actually a technical issue uh, that I think is possible to resolve in a quite compelling sort of interesting way. Uh, but I don't talk about the particular projects that I'm working on until they're finished because I don't like the idea of sort of promotion. I think it's a little bit slimy. However, setting that aside, if there aren't technical solutions to this, if there are only sort of institutional ones, um, the idea is whose decision is that to make and how do we do this? Now, in the first days, uh, again, I consider them sort of the days of primary threat. This is both to the source, the individual doing the revealing, uh, and to the journalists who have to bear the reputational risk that what if this is a hoax? Or what if these are real documents and they mishandle them and they get stolen or they get, uh, you know, whatever, or uh, their institution faces an injunction by the government? Uh, how do you make sure that this still makes its way to public hands? Uh, the model that I put forth uh, was that I would curate these documents uh, to my personal understandings of what's in the public interest, but of course it's not my specialty. I would then provide this archive to journalists who would then be charged with removing my personal bias from the equation. Uh, they would look at this and make their own independent press judgments of what the public needs to know, what the public doesn't need to know. And there are documents in that archive that are never intended to be published, right? These are things that uh, are about legitimate programs uh, that do have real value that should continue. But if journalists don't have that context of what is an effective program, a lawful program, and what is an ineffective, unlawful program, they can't make that proper public interest determination. Now, once they had written their stories, I required them personally, and a lot of people take uh, issue with this, and that's proper, right? Uh, I'm an animal of government, right? I'm I self-selected to join the CIA, the NSA, and so on and so forth. And I said to the journalists, I'd like you to take your stories once you've published them and share the themes of them at least, the names of the program with the government. So the government could basically give you a sanity check and go, is this gonna put a particular life at risk? Now the government doesn't get the veto here. The government can't say you can't do this, but the government did have an opportunity to make their case that maybe the journalist overlooked something, some equity, some interest that should be taken into account. Uh, now, from my perspective, this was probably the best that I could have done acting in a vacuum. But then Ron brought up this question of what should the next generation do? And I would argue, actually, that I'm not the best place to make that argument. So actually, uh, Ron and Amy, I'd like to turn it over to you. What do you think the next whistleblower should do when they're confronted with sort of evidence of unlawful or unconstitutional activity? Well, uh, you know, I... I Reflecting on the decisions that you made and, and uh, ha having spoken to some of the people uh, that I've spoken to in the, in the more on the conservative side of the spectrum, I guess one of the benefits, if you want to call it that, of uh, being in the position at the Citizen Lab where we've done research on uh, cyber espionage networks, um, I, I've been fortunate to be able to uh, enter into conversations with people who are part of uh, national security circles and NSA, FBI, and so on. And um, I'm, I'm really uh, shocked at, at the extreme uh, reaction that I still see to this day uh, to what you did, Ed, in, in those conversations, because I certainly don't share that. I, I see uh, what you uh, did as um, a, a heroic effort to open up a much needed public debate and uh, we're all very grateful for that as citizens. This needed to happen. There were things some of us knew were going on. 
uh, but there, it wasn't happening in the, in the conversation. And, um, and, and so I think that obviously the situation that you're in, the country that you now find yourself in, uh, you're not in a position to be given a fair trial um, under the charges that you've been charged with. Um, that is a pretty daunting prospect for any future whistleblower. Um, and I, I don't know exactly what's going on, but I imagine things have been ratcheted up even more. Um, I was at a, a workshop a couple of weeks ago uh, at MIT, and Admiral Rogers was there, and I mentioned that I would be here in a couple of weeks, and I asked him, uh, what questions would you suggest I ask Edward Snowden? <laughs> and uh, it was as if I brought up Darth Vader. Uh, so... <laughs> um, I just don't, I don't know. I, don't, I, I think that's something that we have to work on within liberal democracy is to make sure there are proper avenues and protections for whistleblowers that extreme charges with the most ultimate penalties aren't put out there uh, for people who do this. That so there is an avenue within uh, law enforcement intelligence organizations for people to raise problems through appropriate channels if now they don't exist and those punishments are so severe. Um, so just, I could follow up on that just yeah, because I, you know, this this is a substantive uh, issue set, and we actually sort of got off uh, the case of how the documentation, the material should be handled, uh, and, and focused on the, the individual, the the me in, in that uh, case. I'm not so concerned with myself. Uh, I actually am very much at peace uh, with the outcome to this point, uh, and whatever happens, uh, I can live with. I expected to go to prison, just disappear, and the public wouldn't even know about what would happen, because it just seems so unlikely that one individual working with a few journalists could actually succeed uh, against such incredibly well-resourced uh, adversaries. But leaving, leaving that aside, leaving aside the fact that I, you know, I don't think I'm an unhappy ending, right? I don't think this is this great deterrent. Um, I'm actually more fulfilled now, more connected now, and more effective now in my work and satisfied with it than I ever have been before. But when we get back on the focus of the actual material, there's one big counterargument to the model question that we were talking about, which is the WikiLeaks model, which is the one that is so uh, regularly uh, sort of insulted by the press and, and, and treated as irresponsible or that put lives at risk and was reckless. Uh, and there, of course, reasonable arguments to be made that these things could have been handled more carefully because a number of documents were published in an unredacted format. However, this is actually, I think, the largest counter argument that we have against the government's arguments that classification is being handled appropriately and that they really still understand what a real secret is. Now, the system of classification in the United States government has three levels. You've got confidential, secret, and top secret. Confidential, the lowest level, says it would cause a single document, right, a single paragraph of this classification that's revealed will cause serious damage to the national security of the United States. Secret is uh, grave damage, grave as in dead people. Um, and top secret is exceptionally grave damage for a single document uh, that gets out of that classification. Now, more than a quarter of a million diplomatic records uh, classified at the secret level, I believe, were published unredacted by WikiLeaks. And I believe three quarters of a million records, I might have those inverted, uh, of actual operational military war records, uh, sort of the Iraq-Afghanistan war logs. Um, and yet at the trial of the individual who was accused and convicted of providing this information to WikiLeaks, uh, Chelsea Manning, the government did not try to argue that a single person had come to harm as a result of these disclosures. Now, if a million documents, a single one of which, because they were at the secret level, would cause grave damage to the security of the, national, uh, of the United States, can be published without anyone coming to harm, without anyone dying, and that's pretty much a matter of public record now because that happened in 2009, we're in 2016 now. Uh, there's no real controversy about it. Are we, have we, have I been too careful? This is a reasonable argument to be made. I don't know the answer, and I don't think I'm the right person to answer it. But increasingly, the older I get, the more uh, sort of familiar I become with this side of the equation, rather than my uh, previous side looking out from the government. Uh, 
we need to be more aggressive as a community. We need to be more comfortable with radicalism and radical change. Radical is not a dirty word. Radical means we're looking at the fundamental problems. It doesn't mean extremist. It doesn't mean we're, you know, uh, arguing in favor of violence or anything like that. But when we're facing systemic problems, we need to think about systemic solutions. So one of the slightly personal story um, that I'm probably going to get in trouble with my family for telling, um, one of the first conversations I had um, Edward, after, after your documents started being released, it was with my mother, and she responded very strongly to the fact that somebody had started releasing these documents, and we talked about it for a long time, and I couldn't figure out why she was so emotional about this. Um, and after about a 30-minute conversation, what she said to me is, what I'm scared of is that you would do the same thing in that position. <laughs> <laughs> Brett, like don't let her already. access the secret <laughs> documents. And I thought that was very interesting because we do tend to personalize a lot of this activity and a lot of the things that we see. Um, but one of the things that I was most amazed by, I have to say, is how many of the programs that were revealed actually were operating the way that they are allowed to operate by law, but still having such a profound impact because the law is really complicated and really legalese and people don't get it um, but when they were able to finally figure out in layman's terms what was happening they reacted to that when they the prism program was put out in colorful slides in the washington post and the guardian people were reacted to that um, and so i'm trying to channel a few of the different audience questions into one which is do we have an obligation to be explaining how these things work in that way not only to people, but also I think there was a specific question about explaining to children um, how security works and how the law works. And what are the barriers to that? And how can we do things, how can we put things in law now, things like transparency maybe, um, in order to try to equal out the playing field and make sure that we are no longer kept in the dark about how these programs are operating and what's happening in the governments, not only in the US, but around the world and what's going on? Is, is there anything we can do? Uh, so I don't, I don't mind going first, if you don't mind, Ed, on that. Um, Please. Uh, so actually, I was speaking with Joseph Men uh, yesterday, and he brought up a really good point uh, that I hadn't quite thought of, which is that um, organizations like the NSA, we, we typically associate their powerful capabilities with technical exploits. And we often overlook the fact that organizations like that and their partners uh, have probably equal resources and capabilities that they devote to legal exploits. And, um, you know, I've spent my entire career trying to understand the world of information security and signals intelligence and so on. And I must say, I'm not an American, but looking at the legal system here, I'm still befuddled by the different uh, layers of uh, obfuscating legal arrangements that cover this or that, and it's like a a house of cards that and mystery uh, tunnels of legal exceptions and loopholes that apply to different aspects and that this is uh, extraordinary in terms of a cloak that can shield various aspects of this and it's very hard to uh, bring accountability to it let alone explain it to the public in a way that makes sense um, and of course that's the United States which among all of the five eyes and probably arguably uh, in the world has uh, the most adversarial um, and uh, rigorous oversight mechanisms in place, uh, certainly uh, better than in my country, in Canada, uh, where we have a CSE commissioner, uh, essentially a retired judge who once a year does a review, um, very rarely finds anything wrong because the judge is actually just uh, making sure that the government is complying with their own interpretation of laws which themselves are secret. <laughs> so um, uh, this is extraordinary and it's, it shows just how far we are removed from the basic uh, checks and balances that are at the heart of liberal democracy. Um, so we have to somehow claw those back and, and bring back some um, measure of proper restraints around uh, the exercise of power by governments but it, it is extraordinarily complicated on the legal side. 
just a personal note of opinion there on uh, Canada's role. It's true, their oversight is hideous. It's, it's never been effective because it was never really thought about. But there's a reason for that. Um, in my experience of the Five Eyes, uh, the Canadian intelligence services were always the least aggressive. They were the least adventurous. They didn't really push the legal boundaries. Uh, it was difficult to target Canadians uh, legally and, and so on and so forth for surveillance. Uh, and it wasn't until the recent government, I'm not Canadian, so I might get the names wrong here, I believe it was the Harper government, uh, that things really started to change. And suddenly oversight became more important because they became much more aggressive in a very short period of time. Um, but setting that aside, the, the broader challenge there um, that, that Amy was, was bringing up was how do we teach children about this? Um, and this is really difficult because what we're inheriting is we're inheriting a culture here uh, from sort of thousands of years of, of human progress, of civilization, uh, where the way that we kept people in line uh, was explaining to them that there's an omniscient being somewhere up there above you, uh, whether it's a god, whether it's your lord, whether it's your president or whoever, uh, or the secret police, who know what it is you're doing. Uh, and so because of that, you shouldn't do anything bad. Could just be your parents. Um, and that kind of authoritarian mentality is our first step. That's our indoctrination into the culture of human interrelationship uh, at a large scale. Now, something happened with the progress of technology, with the progress of human culture, uh, where we started to see people beginning to challenge power more and more. We began to see the public gaining greater and greater voices uh, in the direction of their governments. We saw sort of an explosion of liberal democracy. And at some point, intelligence services, which is really a euphemism for state security agencies, uh, because they're not really protecting the public, they're protecting the state, they're protecting, when they say national security, what they mean is the institutions of that nation, not really the country and its people particularly. Um, there is, a culture within government, and I've seen it sitting in meetings, you know, throughout my career. Uh, you see it in briefings, you see it in slides, you see it everywhere, um, where they go, what can we do, not what should we do? And eventually technology reached the point where in secret, behind closed doors, without the involvement of the public, uh, the NSA and groups like it realized that, well, while we may not be able to ask God a question about what this person is doing, if you believe in God, uh, we can build our own. We can create a system that simply watches all of the communications of everyone all the time and files it away. We're not going to look at it all the time, all day long, because we don't have time for all of that. But if we ever want to ask God a question, well, he works for us now. And how, how, do, you, how do you deal with that culturally? How do you make people realize how repugnant that is? when it's very difficult in even in most modern societies to even have discussions about that level of disparity in power, almost religious disparities in power. When you're disempowered to a point where if you wanted to resist, if you wanted to change something, if you really wanted to contest something, uh, you might simply lack the capability, no matter how well organized you are. That's something that if we don't recognize it, uh, pardon me for speaking a little bit nationalistically here, it's just my culture. Uh, if it's not inhuman, it is un-American. And I think the only way that we can start doing that is, again, thinking about our language. Think about how we phrase things. Think about how we communicate. What are the cultures that we're building, that we're passing to our friends? You know, when I was growing up, when I was in school, uh, whenever somebody asked you something uh, or basically threw shade on your activities. They didn't approve of your choices or your language or whatever. We used to say it's a free country, isn't it? I don't hear that a lot anymore. I don't see that on shows. I don't see that in movies. When our values have begun to fall out of favor in the terms of the way they're communicated, we need to think very hard about are we losing them? And if we are, how can we reinforce them? So I want to give you both time for um, some short closing comments, because I think we're about at time, or a little over time. Um, but I want to throw two thoughts to you. Um, and you can either respond to either of these or go off on your own way. 
Um, the first is that yesterday I was actually sent a photo of a panel on technology policy from back in Washington, D.C. And the reason I was sent that photo was because the panel consisted of five white men. Um, and I can't help but look at the stage today and see that we have a, a close problem um, and calling myself out here a little bit. Um, so the first one is, can we support efforts, how do we support efforts um, by groups and organizations to help protect um, marginalized and vulnerable communities, especially when um, they are far too often left out of the conversation. The second piece that I want to throw out there for comment, potentially, is that I was recently told by a former um, national security high-level official that terror, the threat of terrorism kept him awake at night. And I, I told him that I don't believe him. Um, <laughs> because I actually don't think that he loses sleep over that. Um, but is there anything that you would say on the same level? Is there anything that you think keeps you awake at night? Um, any worries that you have that you, when you look out and think, this is a real threat that we're facing right now, and this is a thing that I think is, a, is going to be a problem as the future goes on? Uh, so I think I can answer those both in more or less the same way. I, I think that um, one of the... Uh, uh, principal focuses of the Citizen Lab has been to do uh, research and develop partnerships with uh, organizations in the Global South. And this has, I think, provided us with some insight into trends that are happening that may not be evident to people who live in the United States or Canada. And uh, <clears throat> frankly, I think the trends are, are really quite disturbing. I think that um, we see uh, uh, problems magnified in that part of the world um, that actually we're contributing to uh, in many ways by our decisions that we make here, or at least we can't stand up and, and say on principled grounds, it's wrong to build in surveillance by design into your equipment, into your telecommunications infrastructure. It's wrong to use computer network attacks to target human rights activists and journalists and so on, when essentially we're doing those very same things uh, here. And uh, if you look just at the demographics, um, the number of users that are coming out of uh, countries now that um, are beginning not only to use the technologies, use the internet, but actually design and shape them. Um, very shortly, those of us who live in North America will be living in a world not of our making. And uh, I think for that reason alone, it's very important uh, to make sure to bring into these conversations uh, people who are living in those uh, societies and um, understand what is important to them, what are, are, are the risks that they see from their perspective, and how we might help them uh, undertake their mission. Uh, we've had a long-standing working relationship uh, with uh, Tibetan communities, and I've, been, I've, I've learned so much from them about how to approach not just uh, a sense of uh, community response. I mean, these are the Tibetans are among the most highly targeted uh, communities in the world. As I said before, they're like canaries in a coal mine because of the situation there. Uh, so they've seen everything thrown at them. Uh, when you hear uh, US government officials talk about uh, advanced persistent threats targeting Fortune 500 companies, Tibetans are experiencing that as well. Uh, the way that they've reacted to that, I think, has been really admirable, both in terms of network defenses, but also in terms of educating their community on best practice. And that's why you need to bring in people outside the usual suspects uh, into these conversations. Since there was, there was a lot in there, I'm going to address the diversity part first. Um, the real key on this, I think, is traditionally, at least as I look at it, again, I'm an engineer, I'm not a politician, I'm not a sociologist, I don't have a lot of background in the, the social justice issues. Uh, I, I see it as a product of sort of structures, of incentives. That's how I sort of try to puzzle out human behavior in general. And technology, for the longest time, has been sort of a rich man's sport. Uh, which demographically was going to mean it's going to be smaller communities of primarily white people. Uh, and STEM, uh, sort of the body of STEM experts, had been primarily male. Now, this is beginning to change very slowly, but it is beginning to change. And we do need to focus more on it. One of the things that 
actually encourages me on this uh, is the fact that I'm seeing more and more people who come from underprivileged backgrounds, uh, who come from minority backgrounds, uh, who didn't enjoy the same advantages that, for example, I myself did, uh, and yet they're much more capable relative to me uh, than I was at that age. Uh, and, you know, maybe this is just advances in technology and, uh, you know, sort of each generation gets better than the last. Uh, but I like to think that it's something more. I like to think that, you know, when you have people uh, who have been exposed to different challenges, different environments, they bring different perspectives, new perspectives that may actually, in the ultimate calculus, uh, produce a greater capability. Um, and when there's more of us with more perspectives, I think we're going to have basically better outcomes overall as a community. Now, moving on to the uh, the issue of the blinking red terrorism is worse than it's ever been. It's simply false. We know it's false, at least in the West, right? Uh, there was a recent uh, sort of media hysteria over the attacks in Brussels, uh, which were a monstrous crime. But when you look at the actual metrics of lives lost due to terrorism over the case of the last you know, 40, 50 years in, in Western Europe, uh, they lost more lives more regularly in the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, with issues in groups like the IRA and the ETA uh, than they have ever lost uh, against adversaries like Al Qaeda or ISIS. And the sophistication, the scope, the scale of the networks, the persistence of them, their capability, their ability to influence policy uh, and, and shape our response was much higher in previous eras as well. Uh, it's too easy for us to forget that Margaret Thatcher, the former prime minister in the UK, uh, had the IRA able to actually place explosives in her hotel and nearly kill her at a summit. Um, yes, it is outrageous, it's appalling, uh, and we should condemn uh, the people who are engaged in the kind of murderous criminality that's claiming lives at uh, subway stations and airports. But at the same time, we should not delude ourselves into thinking we face a period of objectively greater threat now than when our actual structures of government with all of their security services at their hardest targets uh, were nearly getting blown up on a regular basis. Well, I want to just, I think I speak for most of the people in the room, maybe everybody in the room, in saying that you are two of the people that I admire most in the world. And I want to have the deepest thanks to both of you for being here and for speaking with us and for answering questions and talking about your work and your past work and your future work um, and everything that you do for the community. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Um, the conference continues. Um, I think we're taking a break and then switching on to the next session. Thank you. <laughs>